Ladies and gentlemen, our referee has called a stop to this contest, declaring the winner by knockout and new MMA gentlemen and welcome to another exciting round of and new MMA show. I'm your host Michael Hansen in a new location and I'm joined this week as I always am by my two friends who bring MMA punditry to new heights. Introducing to you first from New York, he's Mark Prio. What's up man? You Thank might you. have to find a way to speak louder than this because and you no. are whispering. Wow. It, it, seems, it seems like you have somebody like hidden in your basement, potentially you. <laughs> And you're trying not to I'm, say anything. I'm the one who's hidden, yes. Yeah. How close are you to sleeping people right now? I'm pretty close. They're upstairs, and they're young. They're young? You should... There are, are a few young children in this house. Oh, there are? Oh, okay. One of them is mine, my, my own. I thought it was just your kid, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right, well, I don't know what we're going to do with you. I guess <laughs> the people just aren't going to hear I'm gonna you. I'm going to try my best. We'll see if my wife uh... texts me and is like, shut up, idiot. Yeah, I'm gonna have my go. dub. Text gonna have my say, dub over the whole. Show. Let me know how it goes. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, uh, Merry Christmas to everyone. I know we made a little social media post. I'm sure not everyone saw it. Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays, the whole shebang. We're almost getting to the new year, but we are back for one more show in 2022. So let's do it. All right, and, and Happy Kwanzaa, because I'm sure way, somebody. Like, Somebody celebrates Kwanzaa out there, and I think that's going on, too. Yeah, man. So we'll that do that well. one, too. Fair. And introducing from Florida, the Sunshine State, he is the Nicaragua nightmare, Omar Artola. Is this better, by the way, if I hold my little microphone it up is. here? It is. Things are going better. Oh, right my now. little audio bar, it's way higher. Yeah. Okay. This you still seem like a kidnapper, now. but it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Am I kidnapper or kidnapped? Now the people who I'm are not watching sure anymore. the show are just going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> I think they're watching like an undercover mission take place. Omar, how was your Christmas? Moving now, moving on him now. Uh, Christmas was good. Christmas was good. We spent it with the family. Um, parents stayed up north. There was that, you know, you guys all know, but for those of you who don't, there was a huge cold wave that swept all across the United States, Florida included. So even though my temperatures went down to like mid to high 30s, everybody else was basically negative something around the country. So I didn't have too much to complain about. I had to break out a coat for the first time this year. <laughs> Still uh, had one and left I wore, I dug for it, but I did. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then I wore some furry shoes. And that was me. I met my in-laws here in a suburb south of Buffalo, which got oh, hit yeah. super hard. Dude. Unfortunately, a, a few dozen like fatalities, Buffalo. awful stuff. More awful. than that. Buffalo yeah. is wild right now. They they are trying to go for the mayor's head right now because apparently he didn't do enough to really prepare and have them prepared. Oh there were people that were frozen in the middle of the street in their yeah. cars, couldn't get out. Police were never, you know, like no emergency services were ever sent out to these people. It was crazy. People were Dude, on hold, region, never got any help yeah. at all. This whole region gets hit every single year in winter. So people are like, I can't believe that they were more prepared. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. I'll tell you this. How as many, somebody who has people? lived in, in Buffalo for, a, I would say, a good amount of time. I, I wasn't there forever, but I was there for, dude, I was there for seven years. I didn't know that. I, Did I, know I that? went to school in Buffalo, and then I lived there a few years after I got out of school. That was how oh. I started with Apple. So oh, okay. I've lived there. I've lived through those damn winters. That's why I'm done. That's one of the reasons why I came to Florida because I'm I'm over it. Um, the wind up there is next level. The snow up there is next level. I mean, it you is. can literally have feet of snow overnight, not get out of your house because the door is blocked. Um, there's a lot of real shit that goes on up there. And the worst part is if you have a house, you're fine for the most part, right? You've got your heat. you got whatever. Ideally, the electricity is working. But the homeless up there and people who are outside – are generally fucked, like on a on yeah, a real level. That's all I could think about here yeah. when we had the two days in a row where the feels like was like minus seven. Like every time I had to go outside, it was like my brain, I would step outside and be like, all right, it's not so bad. And then literally 30 seconds would pass and I would be like, holy fuck, holy fuck, holy fuck, I have to get back in the door. And yeah. I kept thinking about like, what the fuck do people do yeah. who are out here right now? 
Yeah. But, well, when I was in college uh, in Buffalo, there was a kid who got kid who died on campus because he got drunk, oh as we God. all did in Buffalo, because there's not a shit ton to do up there. Um, but he got drunk and he passed out on the bench during a storm. Oh that boy God. was dead the next morning. He was he was gone. Fucking hell. Wow. Mike, how yeah. many feet of snow are you in right now? And then we got to start the show. Not a ton. Not a weather not show. A, not a ton. We're, we're about <laughs> oh, no. 45 minutes to an hour south of Buffalo, and it's not much snow here at all. It's just oh, okay. probably a few, I mean, a few inches. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, the drive here was easy. Um, but apparently in Buffalo, yeah, there's still like several feet of snow. Wow. Yeah. Because yeah. Well, my friends, city, a couple of my friends live in there. We never yeah. even got snow down here. Just the cold. Wow. That was it. The cold not a drop, not a flurry. If you look at the map, this will be the last thing on Buffalo because it's not a Buffalo podcast. Uh, <laughs> the city of Buffalo is at the very eastern tip of Lake Erie. So, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and weather generally travels west to east across the country. So whatever storm goes all the way across Lake Erie and picks up all the condensation right. and just dumps and the lake on effect. Buffalo. The lake effect, man. The lake okay. Effect. This is not a meteorologist. Let's mix the martial arts. This is not a meteorologist <laughs> podcast. Uh, this is an MMA show. We did well. Though. We could be meteorologists, I think. We did. Yes. <laughs> uh, we solved Lake Effect. <laughs> we could have done a better job than the mayor of Buffalo <laughs> with this uh, with this six minute conversation that we've just had. All right, boys. Well, this week let's uh, quickly run down the show. We're going to uh, start as uh, start off as we always do with our first first segment on the marquee. Talk about fights from this past weekend's. Uh, UFC Fight Night, Cannoneer versus Strickland. We're going to jump into our lightning round. We're going to get an update for Mark and his very own rankings system. We're going to find out what's going on in the headlines of the MMA world outside the cage with our segment Inside the MMA Sphere. Then we're going to look ahead to this weekend's exciting event, crossover event, Bellator versus Ryzen on New Year's Eve. And then we're going to end with a little bit of trivia. So before we get into any of that, gentlemen, let us first thank our fans and our viewers, our listeners, our audience. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, thank you so much. Drop us a like if you haven't done so yet. Uh, consider subscribing to our channel. And uh, if you like any of our takes, let us know down in the comments if you agree. If you disagree, let us know down below as well. We love that thoughtful engagement. If you want audio only, you can find us wherever you get those podcasts. And of course, find us on social media at all the places at and new underscore MMA show. And if you want to sponsor our show, email us and new MMA show at gmail.com. With that being said, gentlemen, let's get into our first segment this week. The name on the marquee has got to be Armin Sarukian, who this past week at UFC Fight Night, Cannonier versus Strickland in the co-main event spot stole the marquee spot on our show at least by defeating uh Demir Ismagulov by unanimous decision 30 27s across the board on all three scorecards mark let me throw it over to you first what was your impression of Sarukin getting it done over the very tough Ismagulov so this was a fight that a lot of people were torn on including us and it was competitive don't get me wrong but this really ended up being a showcase for Armin Sarukin He won every round of the fight. He was faster. He kept Demir guessing. He threw in combos, which helped him. Demir, at least in the in the first half of the fight, was a little more like one shot focused, and and whereas Armin was throwing at least two piece, three piece combos, and it was the last shot that would land. So he had that going for him. And then most notably of all is is he really showed off his grappling in this fight. Um, for what it's worth. At least until Demir got a bit more tired, Demir was unreal at standing back up. Like, insanely good. You could not get that man flat on the mat. Like, he was always posting. It was like his arms were were two more legs. He just has unbelievable arm strength and body control to resist getting put on the mat. But even with that, he couldn't keep Srukin off him. All Srukin's entries were so good, and he varies them, which makes him really tough to defend. And... Because Sarukian kept that pressure and was showing off that grappling threat, I feel like Ismagulov just had to fight a lot off the back foot. He couldn't really get much going because of it. And then even when he tried to turn it up and walk forward, Armin just started ducking under, and he almost had Demir walking into takedowns at that point. 
So Demir was always competitive, but he was rarely the one scoring, and this was mostly a grappling showcase for Armin Sarukian. So he leaned on that in this fight. I think he knew that that, that was his avenue. And he rode it to a big bounce back W after a tough loss in his in his uh, previous fight. Omar, this was uh, Demir's only second professional loss. His first loss under the UFC banner, and his first loss since 2015. What was your impression? Did that make it that all all the more impressive for uh, Sarukin to to get it done over such a talented guy? Yeah, I mean, when we talked about it last week, um, we talked about how difficult this fight was going to be to pick because of the skill of both these guys. We, I thought it would be kind of like a coin flip um, as far as that is concerned. Um, but it ended up being, <clears throat> like like Mark said, it kind of ended up being a big deal for Saruki to kind of go through all three rounds, taking all three rounds, being ahead all three rounds. Um, I always thought he was one step ahead uh, the entire time. Um I, I was actually super impressed. It, it, this kind of goes back to the point that we made a couple weeks ago where these divisions are so stacked. These divisions are full of people that are significantly good. And a guy like Ismagulov wouldn't normally get sunned, I would imagine, like this by very many guys. And yet here's Armin Sarukian, and they're both in this division at the same time going for the same thing. And shit like this is going to happen. And it was a really good standout uh, performance from Saruki, and I thought the trips and the takedowns I thought were absolutely fantastic. They were really standout. Mark, with this victory, Saruki is back in the win column after a very close decision loss to Mateusz Gamrat. <clears throat> Put on that matchmaker hat. What would you do next with Armin Saruki in the UFC lightweight division? I don't. I mean, it's not going to happen. I don't hate the idea of him just fighting Gamrot again because I felt like that result was so controversial, and I really thought Armin did win that fight. But I'm sure we're not going to go that route. Um, it's a very close fight. In which case, I think Armin may have to wait and see kind of how the chips fall once the rest of the lightweight division is booked. We have a lot of guys who aren't booked right now trying to see what fight they may get. Like, you know, is some form of Oliveira, Poirier, Daryush going to be made? Is Chandler going to get Connor? Gaethje and Fazeev rumor was floating around. I just feel like there's a lot of moving parts, so it's kind of tough to match him up. But I kind of feel like maybe whoever is the guy left that is not in one of those marquee, marquee fights is potentially who Armin Sarukian could fight. Yeah, I mean, he's so young and, and still up and coming. Uh, there's a lot of names out there for him to match up against. Omar, any any matchups that you find to be tantalizing for Sarukian? I think it's super interesting that for a division that literally has nobody officially scheduled, there is all the mess in the world when it comes to getting these people to actually pair up with one another at this point. That's it is true. a mess in the lightweight division. And nobody is scheduled. And I mean nobody in the top 15, with the exception of the champion and, and, and Volkanovsky. Yeah. Um, so with that being said, with all the mess, the one fight right now that really stands out for a couple different reasons. One, it would be a, a real highlight for, for Sarukian. Uh, but on the other hand, Dan Hooker might be able to make a nice little jump back into the hearts and the minds of those who thought he was something by defeating an up-and-comer like Armin Sarukian. I think that'd be an interesting fight. <clears throat> what about Ismagulov? Uh, he's still right there. He's only 31 years old compared to Sarukian's 26. So he's not going... Anywhere, uh, any exciting matchups you think for for Ismagulov, Omar? Uh, I would probably put him up against the last guy who also lost to Armin Sarukian and pair him up with Joel Alvarez, uh, and just nice. see what both of those guys have for each other. Mark, that's a good one. Um, I just throw out Gamrot's name. I think that works. Gamrot's coming off a loss. I feel like these guys have kind of fought a lot of the same guys. Like they both fought Kutate Ladze. Now, now they both yeah. fought Sarukian. They haven't fought each other. I feel like they're all kind of around the same area in that division. Um, if if not that, I also think he could be a good test for Grant Dawson as like Dawson's first ranked test. Yeah, I think that could be a cool fight as well. Yeah, man. I mean, I like Sarukin's point. I, I heard him making uh, leading into this fight um, that the top guys at lightweight they don't want to fight anybody. 
I think he mentioned the top uh, top three or top five. Or they just want to fight each other, and that's it. Yep. I and, mean, there's uh, been I, there's an argument for a lot of recycling having gone on in the lightweight division, um, but the the reality was they were that was a top heavy division. You didn't really have a ton of guys at the time on the bottom half of that division that really justified a fight with those guys. You would you could put them in, you know, because there's a default or you know you want to throw somebody in, but like it didn't really make any sense. The guys hadn't really deserved it. Now you got animals like Armin Sarukian cleanly moving up the division. You've got uh, the the resurgence of Moicano coming back in from wherever the hell. I mean, you've got you've got a lot of things that are now moving on, and and on top of that, you've got guys who have lost, right? You've got like the the um, the Tonys who have lost, who's now out of the the top fifteen for the first time in a decade, Forever, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And Conor McGregor also RDA is still ranked, but he should be coming out too because he's a welcome. Conor McGregor is also out of the top fifteen as well. Another one for the first time in like a decade. Yeah, you know, so it's there's a lot of things that have been adjusting themselves and moving around, and and frankly, things just make a lot more sense I think now than they did a year ago. Agree. I get Armin's point, but I I do feel like the matchups that were made kind of were the matchups that had to be made. And I've been saying it myself: these guys at the bottom kind of haven't been able to get a fight. So at the bottom of the top ten, I mean, haven't been able to get a fight with the guys at the top. But I just feel like it didn't work out now we're here in my opinion now is where i'll be annoyed like i hear, I hear people saying like let's do poirier gaethje 2 again and like as much as sure we'd all enjoy the fuck out of that fight i just don't think it's what we should be doing like i think gaethje should be fighting rafael faziv or someone like that and i think out of poirier Oliveira, and dariush whatever two are going to fight each other i think the other guy should fight a sarukian or someone like that like i think we are now at that point where this needs to be happening all right yeah, okay. I agree. Uh, any other words you guys want to say about this lightweight fight between Sarukian and Ismagulov? Okay, let's move on. Good fight, man. It's a great fight. It was, man. It was a great fight. It kind of lived up to the hype. Uh, a fight that did not quite live up to the hype was the main event of this UFC fight night in the middleweight division between Jared Cannonier and Sean Strickland. Uh, it definitely had the potential to be a scrap and to be a, a barn burner, but stylistically, I, I felt that there was a strong possibility that uh, we were going to get this kind of fight mostly out of Jared Cannonier. I feel I felt like Sean Strickland pretty much fought a Sean Strickland kind of fight for the most part, and uh, Cannonier was a little tight, a little tentative. Found some big shots. Let's see what you guys have to say. Omar, give us your take. Of the decision, uh, somewhat controversial with it being a split decision. Sean Strickland was pretty upset with the way that the scorecards played out. Uh, what's your take? So I know Mark has watched this a second time and has a different take from the first time. But but when we did watch this the first time, we all knew the scorecards were going to be all over the place. And um, they were. Regardless, they really were. and they definitely were. And I think regardless of what we thought the scorecards were in that moment, I think we all recognize that there were smaller arguments to be made for all of these other little random ass scorecards. Um, the rounds were very close. The fight I thought was very close. Um, you know, if I looked at the fight as a whole, I think it'd be different than if I looked at it round by round. Um, I did think Sean Strickland did more work. I thought he did a lot more damage. Um, but I think there were, there were some visible differences in the way that the strikes were. There wasn't really a lot of turnover from Strickland. A lot of it was a lot of contact. Um, not a lot of power, not a lot of hip rotation. It's just literally just making contact. Um, it's a great point. whereas, whereas, uh, Cannoneer was trying to hit a home run for all intents and purposes. And every time he made contact with Strickland's face, Strickland popped back. Um, there was a lot of power in those punches and to Strickland's credit, he's got a chin. He ate a lot of shit that I think a lot of people would have went down off of. Um, but they were very few and far between from Cannoneer as they were for Strickland, but Strickland didn't really do a ton of visible damage. And that potentially could have swayed the judges in different directions at the end of each individual round. I think as Brown, I think if you judge the fight as a whole, it'd be hard to say that Strick, Sean Strickland didn't do more work in five rounds than Cannoneer did. But, um, but again, it was, I thought it was, I knew it was going to be a tough fight to, to score. I knew the judges were going to get destroyed for it. Um, 
And I do want to give credit to Strickland's corner because Strickland's corner was very honest with him. Like, I don't know where the score is. I don't know what the judges are doing right now. This is a close fight. You need to go out there and you need to finish him. And he did not. But we need a lot more corner with a lot more honesty in those situations. Because telling these guys, yeah, you're up four rounds. And then they go out and they're fucking dancing around and having a great time. Like they've won and they get caught in this like, oh, I thought I won. When they didn't, it gets weird. Um, so credit to the, to, to the, to the corner for that, but it was a messy fight as far as the judging score was, con- was concerned. Okay, Mark, let's bring you in here. Give us your take, your assessment of the decision of the fight overall. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, as Omar said, watching that fight live, I was torn on every round. It, it was all over the place. Uh, I think everyone was torn. The commentary was torn. Obviously the judges were torn. When I sat down and rewatched that fight. I'm honestly a little confused as to why I was so torn. Like, it's a close fight. Don't get me wrong, but I think Sean Strickland wins all of the first three rounds of that fight, and he might have even won the fourth. Like, I, again, I don't want to give the wrong impression. I, I think definitely three through five were all very close rounds. So if you want to give Kanye all those and say he won the fight, I can't really hate you for it. It's, it's really only one and two that I think absolutely have to go one way, which, it, which is Strickland once I rewatched it. Mm-hmm. But I even think it's it's tough to justify not giving Strickland one of three or four. I I can't help but feel he got a little bit robbed in this fight. My guess is that he feels the same. And I think really the story for him was that he kind of had a mastery of the boxing range all fight long that he was able to maintain. Like he stood his ground. He had great head movement. He was one or two inches outside of so many shots that Jared threw that I think maybe people thought landed live and they and they were stopping you know an inch or two short full extension he was not hitting sean he blocked a ton of punches with his arms with his hands even dean thomas said it on on the broadcast he was like man a ton of these punches are hitting strickland in the arms so i don't know how much credit we are giving to to strikes that are landing on arms but there was a lot of them and and sean was really keeping up some beautiful footwork he was popping the jab all fight long and, yeah, I think a lot of what played into it is what Omar said. It, it, he was working a lot behind the jab. You know, typical style, hands down, stepping back, pop. You know, that, that's what Sean Strickland does. He wasn't turning over the hips. He wasn't throwing the, the, the more winging punches, not even really too many hooks, which Cannonier was doing. And Cannonier was maybe walking forward a bit more. And I think in a fight that was that close visually, maybe that's what the judges went to. But you really watch that one back. To me, it's tough to say Sean Strickland didn't win that fight. And um, Jared made good adjustments. He started u- utilizing the leg kick, which was working really well for him. He did find some ways to get inside. But I just don't I don't think he did enough. So competitive fight, obviously. But if that's up to me, I think the other guy should have got the nod there. So it, you it should with- also be noted. It, I'm sorry. It should also be noted that Jared Cannonier still annoys the fuck out of me because – and, and I said this in the text message. You get to a point in these fights where it's, it's literally going to be out of reach. And at some point, you have to do something to make a significant difference in how the fight is going. You can't tell me that Jared Kennedy didn't know how close that fight was by the end of the third round. How are you still not throwing anything in rounds four and five? Like I, I, I think Jared Kennedy has only one way of fighting which is why I've never been a Jared Cannonier guy. I don't think he can do other things. Whereas if you told Sean, Sean Strickland, hey, Sean, you got to win rounds four and five. You're down two to one right now. I think he could have fought much differently and done it. If you told that to Jared, I think he would have been like, all right, well, hopefully I do, and fought the exact same way. We saw is, shades of promise in, that, in that, that Brunson fight. And like, did he's he, did he just back with him? I don't. I, I feel like he is one of the most limited. Is not the right word, but I, I can't think of a better word. He is one of the most limited top tier fighters that we've ever seen. Like he can't. He can't open his game up. It just is what it is, and it works or it doesn't. That's yeah, I would say crazy. straight. He's like a straightforward kind of a of a, of a fighter. Yeah, he's gonna fight his game plan. So I went on uh, MMA decisions because I was curious about this fight. Every single round is essentially a 50-50 round. (laughs) Every single one. So it's, like I said, it was a messy, messy fight. 
it was not an easy fight to score. And I think one of these problems, it, they started. I think they're starting to talk about it a lot more now. But it's it's really the criteria for these fights is how these judges are expected to score these fights is really arbitrary and it's very much left up to the interpretation. Um, and it does it does influence or allow the influence of bias when it comes to people and their preference in how fights are fought. You know what I mean? You're not going to tell me a jiu-jitsu guy is not going to be more preferential over certain positions and aspects of a fight that are that are on the ground than a guy who grew up boxing. It just th – their outlooks on the fights I think are going to be completely different. Um, I just – I think at some point if we want to fix MMA judging, you got to fix the criteria. Well, of course. Yeah. Well, yep. guys, we, we've solved enough problems – already on this show tonight we we're, we've solved lake effect <laughs> and the fact that we have to evacuate the city of buffalo and just, nobody should just no one should live in that region anymore guys but mma that's judging fucking left that's for another that's for another night for us oh boy well i i don't entirely agree i think sean strickland also pretty much fights the way sean strickland fights he's, he's not a game planner He's gonna he's gonna come forward. He's gonna box the way that he does in that particular way with his hands kind of down, and it works for him too. I just think he could have turned it up if he knew that he. I, had I to. agree. I think he I thought agree. he was I, winning. But like, so what? So what? How are you teeing off on a guy so consistently and you don't turn it up at all? Like not even not even push the gas a little bit, see if you can redline just a smidge and see what happens, and then tone it back down if it's not working out. Like, the, yeah, the fact that no one changes up their 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 pressure and their tempo or anything like that. I don't. Maybe they are playing it safe. Maybe they don't want to put themselves in bad situations. But but then don't bitch. Like if you're not going to do everything possible to win that fight, then don't bitch when you don't win off of a close fight. Just don't do it. Yeah. Uh, the scorecards. Oh, this is what I pulled up before I wanted to mention. Uh, Sal D'Amato scored the fight the way you would have, Mark. He gave Sean Strickland rounds one, two, and three, and then also round five. Let's oh, I wouldn't see. have given – I thought five was the only round that was clearly – not clearly, but I thought five was the best argument for Cannon here. Okay. Uh, cl Derek clearly gave – Cannoneer, one, two, three, and five. So the exact opposite of Diamato. And then uh, Junichiro Camillo scored it for Cannoneer, one, two, four, five. And only round three for Strickland. Not a single so, unanimous round in the fight. Not a single unanimous. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Crazy. Crazy. Anyhow, I wonder let's when the match last up time these we saw guys real quick. Say again? I wonder when the last time we saw that is. Yeah. Anybody who knows, comment below and let us know. Uh, let's quickly match up the winner, Jared Cannonier. So he keeps his spot. Mark, I'm interested to see where you have him in your ranking system. Uh, Mark, let me stick with you. What What would you do with Cannonier next since he got the W? I have Cannonier number five. I think if I remember right, the UFC has him higher than that. Uh, he's five for me. I don't know what you do with him. Uh, he may have to wait a little bit. I know, obviously, Paolo Costa just fell out of this Whitaker fight. Is it realistic to think that they'd already give Cannonier another shot at Whitaker? I know two years have passed, so maybe Whitaker does need a fight, and most guys seem to be matched up. So I guess that's possible. Um, if not, maybe he waits for the Vittori and Roman Delice winner. But uh, I'm curious to see what Omar thinks. Yeah, Omar, go. So, Jared Cannonier is number three on the UFC's rankings. Um, this is another one that's kind of a mess of a division right now. And guys are just starting to climb up now uh, at the bottom of this, the bottom half of this ranking. But this is another one where I feel like we've recycled a few guys up here in a few fights. And you can't really argue with it. You've got Robert Whitaker, one of the best in the world, who doesn't really lose to anyone other than Izzy. Izzy just lost, lost for the first time in the middleweight division in his career, uh, in his MMA career. I mean, it's there's not a lot of movement here for 
uh, Jared Cannonier to really do anything with. Um, it'd be nice if they could do the the, the Perth one on short notice uh, and get Robert Whitaker that fight. I doubt that this can happen at this point. Um, Whitaker generally needs to cut some weight, so he would have already have needed to keep going in order, I would imagine, to make mm-hmm. weight and all that other stuff. So, um, I don't know, man. Uh, does Vittori? I don't know if Vittori has a fight lined up at this point. Yeah, I just um, said Roman Delizzi. That's right. That's right. They just did that one. Yeah, that's on my list. Which, in retrospect, now, like, I feel like I would have rather seen Vittori Cannonier get booked. As much as that's a fun fight, I just feel like Vittori Cannonier makes more sense. Yeah. And like, who the hell knows what's going on with Costa? And Costa is like a number, what, five, six, yeah. seven, something like that. Um, yeah. Hey. So if yeah, got it's, him it, re-signed, that could work. It's a mess. Um, yeah. Because how far down do you go with Cannonier? Like, you know what's an idea? At what point does he... What weight class is Chimaya fighting at next? Who knows? Because that's not a bad 70? one. Damn, you want to throw him in there? Well, I guess. If he's going to take a middleweight fight, most of these guys are booked up. Jared Cannon is not a bad welcome committee to middleweight. I mean, I don't hate I'm it. Cannon either has to fight or get his ass beat. So, yeah. I'm about it. I'll take it. <laughs> What about Mr. Strickland, guys? Omar, give me a name for Sean Strickland. Oh, uh, Sean Strickland. Why don't we just throw his boy in there? Let's see Sean Strickland and Chris Curtis go at it. I'm fine <laughs> with it. Won't. They wouldn't. They, they absolutely will. Maybe will. They would. Yeah, you're right. So, Sean, so Chris Curtis has said on uh, in an interview, he was like, "If I didn't take a fight with Sean Strickland, he would be so pissed at me." We. He assaults me for free on a daily basis. You think he doesn't want to get paid to assault me? He absolutely would be bad if I didn't take this fight. That's funny. That's funny. Fuck it. I'll watch it. That's not bad then. I'll go, uh, I'll go the winner of this Imavov Gastelum fight. That's going to open up, uh, 2023. Oh, okay. All right, boys. Uh, let's move on down the list because the clock's ticking. Where are we at here? Guy says the clock Caceres. is ticking. I don't even know where we're at. Mr. Caceres. You're in charge of the pace over there, pal. Keep it moving. I got this one wrong. I think I went with Juicy J, Julian Arosa. I think we all did. <clears throat> I think we all did, man. Alex Caceres in the featherweight division uh, defeated Julian Arosa by TKO via head kick. Sneaky, sneaky head kick. Uh, it was nice. It was real nice. In the first round. Official time, 3.04. Uh, Mark, give us your take of the performance of these two featherweights. I couldn't believe how quick this one ended. I fully expected to see an extended scrap out of these boys, but Alex Caceres had other plans. Um, Julian had a hard time finding him all fight. Honestly, Alex seemed faster. He was doing a great job at staying just outside of Julian's range. And then, boy, did he move him right into an unbelievable knockout like that same side hook and head kick combo is such a beautiful combo that honestly I'm surprised we don't see more of but because if you can get your opponent to move his head to the outside of that hook he's sitting right there for that head kick to land but I'm sure the reason we don't see more of it is because it's not an easy combo to throw because you got to balance on the one leg the whole time as you shift from the hook to the head kick and for Caceres, that's light work, but I, not everyone can pull that off. So if you're capable of that like he is, that is a dangerous freaking combo that you can walk someone into. And he landed it as perfectly as you can land it in this one and put Arosa out, put him out bad, and a, a very big statement win for the legitimacy of Alex Caceres. Yeah, man, absolutely. Omar, why don't you weigh in on this uh, awesome head kick knockout by Alex Caceres, Bruce Leroy. Yeah, absolutely beautiful kick. Um, I'm trying to remember the specifics of the kick itself, whether he was southpaw or not the entire time, or if he ended up switching. Um, just gonna, no, he was he was southpaw. So the the beauty of this kick is also the difficulty of this kick because when the guy, so if he's southpaw, right, his left side is essentially his power side, and it's slightly a little bit further back than his front side. So his jab would be his right hand as opposed to in an orthodox stance, his jab would be his left hand. So he's in a southpaw stance. He overthrows 
the power hand, so the left hand in this case, overthrows it. That forces Julian to kind of to slip the punch. He slips off to his right side. In the motion that he throws his 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 cross, he's taking his leg along with him. So it's a two beat, but it's all the same momentum. And there's no real snap to the kick because the kick just comes up. And if you look at the extension on that kick and the rotation that you actually need to make it hit shin bone and not the side of your calf, bro, the, the dexterity for somebody to have in their legs is next level for that kick to land the way that it kicks. So it's, it's not an easy kick. That's probably why you don't see it very often because a lot of guys don't have that kind of hip rotation or dexterity in their legs. It's not normal to have that kind of shit just off the bat. Um, and you, you know, if you watch a lot of MMA guys, there's a very big discrepancy in, you know, the dexterity that they have in their legs and kicks and things like that. You watch a karate tournament, a Taekwondo tournament, they all fucking legs are everywhere. That's what they do. That's how they live. But in MMA, there's so many different styles that they don't always focus on the same type of things that other guys do. So Bruce Leroy is here with all the dexterity in his legs and he showed out that night. Yeah, man. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a combo that like if Izzy threw and knocked someone out people would be talking about and breaking down that combo for and I was going to say weeks but forever possibly yeah. Yeah. and I feel like no one really talked about what Alex, Alex Caceres did and they should because that was that, that will stick in my brain for a while that, that was yeah, beautiful Dude, honestly, it, it gives me shades of when Carlos Condit threw a two-piece, ducked yeah. under, and head-kicked GSP. Yep. It's one of the nastiest yeah. little combos I've ever seen. Shades, you're right. I, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I see it. Sticking with you, Mark, let's match up Alex Caceres real quick, the winner of this featherweight matchup. Where would you go with him next at 145? I think Ryan Hall is due back in the somewhat near future. And I just think putting those two in there and seeing them try to figure out the puzzle that each other presents would be highly entertaining. Nice, nice. Omar, any names? Uh, I, I don't know if uh, Caceres and Andre Feely have ever fought. I feel like they have a while ago, but I'm not sure. If they have it, I think that's this is probably a good time for that to happen. I don't think they have. It's not coming to my mind. I'm looking right now. No. Have not. Make it so, one. number one. What about Julian Erosa, Mark? You got a name for me for Erosa? Yeah, I will take the winner of Josh Kulabau and Melsik Bogdasarian that's coming up and uh, match him up okay. with that man. Omar, any exciting matchups that strike your fancy for Juicy J? So, so you guys know I like Julian Arosa, but at the same time, I don't want to coddle him. And this uh, this gentleman, Charles Jordan, has had some interesting fights in the UFC. Not the best luck in the outcomes, but the man can scrap. So I think it'd be an interesting fight to see who actually comes out on top successful there. Okay, let's move on to the lightweight Arosa division. him out a couple of years ago. God damn or it. One, like, or like one year ago. That's okay. It's a long time ago. <laughs> it's not that long ago. This is bullshit. Yeah, okay, Brian Bravo the, choked him. Crazy. Let's go. Guy. In the lightweight division, Drew Dober defeated Bobby Green by knockout at two minutes forty five seconds of round number two. Omar, give us your <clears throat> breakdown of this little fight that, that went down. It's a wild fight, man. This this was a wild little barn burner. Um Bobby Green was putting the beats on Drew Dober for round one. I mean, he was like Cody Garbrandt and this boy inside of that octagon, short of yeah. moonwalking. I mean, he was putting on moves. Um, he bloodied up Drew Dober. Drew Dober's face was a, a mess by the end of the first round. And it was a lot, honestly, mostly off of jabs, some counter, hook, or counter crosses. Um, but Bobby Green kept it simple. Bobby Crean just laid out the fundamentals as beautifully as you could ever watch. Um, I think he's even better at the fundamentals, frankly, than Sean Strickland. And I say that knowing full well, Bobby Green just got knocked out. Um, 
But he's definitely better. Yeah, I agree. He's he's so damn good. Drew Dober though is 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 a tank, and that is just a fact. I think we've talked about it before. Um, I think something short, nothing short of a sledgehammer to his head, is going to stop Drew Dober. Um, and Bobby Green is just not a sledgehammer. Yeah. So, round one, absolutely Bobby Green's world. Round two, Drew Dober went full juggernaut mode, bit down in his mouthpiece, and eventually was able to push right through a lot of those combos, got Bobby Green up against the cage. Bobby Green zigged and one zag too many and ate some shit for it. So, great fight. Nasty <clears throat> ending from Dober. Um, real hype train killer with Dober. It's fantastic performance. Mark, fill in the blank. Bobby Green is not a sledgehammer, but... Uh... Something that weaves a bee. <laughs> I'm thinking of like a weapon, like a yeah. But weapons don't weave, so I couldn't think of any that worked. I'll go a with the fencing. Bobby I'm Green, a, a fencing sword. Yeah, I he's like a, he's like a nunchuck. He's like a nunchuck. He's a nunchuck. Yeah, he can do a nunchuck. That works. Right. Nice. Uh, yeah, this was a crazy story. The the way this thing played out, uh, I thought Bobby Green could outclass Drew Dober, but holy hell, we got about seven eight minutes of Bobby Green absolutely schooling Drew Dober, and I'm sitting there like, fuck, thank God I picked Bobby Green because this is not even close. Even I didn't think he could look that good against Drew. But then to continue what was the crazy story, we get Drew Dober doing, doing Drew Dober things. The guy just bites down. He accepts that he can't find Bobby Green in there, and he could not. But he says, I got to find a way to walk him down. I got to find a way to get him backed up against the cage. I'll absorb three shots so I can land one shot. And that's exactly what he did. And he was getting clipped every time he tried to walk Bobby Green down. But eventually he gets in there. He switched up his timing really beautifully to land that kill shot left hook that he landed he was it was kind of like one two one two one two like it was like a delay and green just got thrown off by the timing switch and he turned the fight on its head in a matter of seconds and he flipped a fight where he was getting outclassed into a fight where he gets a highlight knockout so that's the thing with drew dober he he is a dog He's a smart fighter, which helps, and he's a dangerous fighter. And, and because of all that, he's never out of it. And that is a monster win for him. Although, I mean, uh, apart from the Islam fight with uh, Bobby Green, I feel like Bobby Green almost never looks bad. He, like, always looks really good. Like, man, this guy's very good at fighting. To be fair, Bobby Green didn't even look bad against Islam. Just Islam looked superior yeah. in general. He just he didn't even let Bobby bad. Green do shit. Yeah. Okay. I did that timing the wrong way, by the way. I slowed it down. He sped it up. It was one, two, one, two, one, two. Like, but if you see the clip, you'll understand what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> Dober has uh, quite a few attributes that he can go. He could go far in lightweight. He could. He could. Uh, he's got a great chin. He has good enough cardio. He has really good power. For, for 55. And yeah, he, he happens does. to be in a division full of killers. He does. So yeah, that chin's not that chin's not going to hold up at the top. You can't you can't can't do what he did with Bobby Green against people like Michael Chandler or Gaethje or even Daryush at this point. Like it's just got, it's not it's got not going to work. He's got a Drew Dober's got a melon. Yeah, he's yeah, got he a does. big head. He does. Uh, Give me a name, Omar, for where where you would want to see Drew Drew Dober go next at fifty five. So he called him out in the cage, and I got to say, I really like I really like to call out uh, him against Jalen Turner would be a hell of a fight. Um, I don't see any yeah. reason why that fight wouldn't fight. cause people to watch at all. That's a great, great fight, great matchup, and it would see if Drew Dober's ready for the top fifteen. Mark? Finally. <clears throat> Yeah, I got no problem with that fight. Uh, just for something different, if we don't get that one, I'll throw out a name that Omar actually used earlier, uh, which is Dan Hooker. I just think that fight would be incredible. I'd love to watch them play the mental game as much as the physical to compare you know, each other's toughness. I just feel like there's a lot of fun angles to that fight. Okay. Nice. Mark, any, any, any names you, do you have for uh, Bobby Green before we move on? 
he looked so good that I kind of want to give him another fairly big chance. Like, I don't want to necessarily reset him. Um, I don't know when Diego Ferreira is due back. I know he was hurt. I feel like it's been a minute. I'm imagining he'll be back soon. But I think someone like that who's kind of been in the edge of those rankings, been in the mix, I'd like to see Bobby get one more shot against that type of a fighter. Okay. Omar? Uh, so for Bobby, hear me out. I don't know if it would happen, but him against Patty Pimblett, I think would be fun. I have no intention of keeping, I have no intention of keeping Patty Pimblett safe at this point. If he dies, he dies. But in the meantime, I'm going to get some good fights out of it. So Patty Pimblett Hmm. versus Bobby Green. I would be picking Bobby. All day. Without really debating it. All day. Yep. Really? Wow. Love it. Oh, yeah. I would. I don't think the ground game of Pimblet is... is get, let me rephrase. I don't think the getting to the ground game of Pimblet is good enough to cause worry for Bobby Green. And the striking, I'm not... We're not even going to do that. Bobby Green's on a different yeah. level. I think Bobby's underrated on the ground. I think against Islam, it doesn't matter because Islam is Islam. Yeah. But as a whole, I, th- I don't think he's... So easy to take advantage of. I don't think it's easy to take down for a wrestler, let alone for somebody who technically doesn't wrestle. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Let's jump down into the prelims of this UFC fight night, Kananir versus Strickland, with some bantamweight Saeed on Saeed violence. So we had Saeed Nurmagomedov defeating Saeed Dekub Kakramanov by submission via... Is it called a ninja choke? Yeah, it was a ninja choke. That's sick. Good name. Uh, 350 of round number two, Omar. Give us your take of this bantamweight matchup. So I feel like this was another one that we had some issues picking. I think we had sort of a coin flip kind of deal here. Um, I can't remember for the life of me who I ended up picking. I feel like I might have went uh, Kakramanov here. Uh, Your boy got it right. You got Nurmagomedov. It was a nasty fight, man. That was that was a wild little fight up until it ended. I mean, they were they were scrapping, they were scrapping back and forth. The pace was high, um, like it usually is for guys like this. You know, one thirty five, especially these high level wrestlers, um, these Dax Danny kids. But he he took an opportunity. That, you know, while they were rolling and scrapping, got against the cage. He grabbed his neck. And was able to just pull off a nice little ninja choke, just like a modified guillotine, basically. Yeah, but yeah. it was it was beautiful. It's good. Mark. Good take. I'm looking up. Uh yeah, that's what I thought. I'm gonna correct us before the comments yell at us. Uh Kakramanov is Uzbek, not Dagestani. Namagomedov. Oh. Is not Namagomedov oh, not yeah. Dagestani? He oh, is that's who I, I mean. Kid. I think both of them. Yeah. Oh no. I gotcha, I gotcha. meant yeah. I'm just protecting you from the comment guys who like to tell us where people are from, even though we know. No, I hear you. They would tell um, me that not only is he not from Dagestan, but to, you know, never forget Islam. So I get yeah. it. I get it. I understand. Uh, um, yeah. The pace in this fight was something to watch. Um, Kakramanov brought the pressure just like you knew he would. He knew, like we all knew that he would have to be, that that would have to be the game plan just to get inside of the, the distance striking that Saeed brings to the table. And that's often the game plan for Kakramanov anyway. So, yeah, he was ready to go. And to be honest, he had even more success with the pressure than I imagined that he could. He, he controlled that fight for nearly as long as it lasted. But on the flip side, Saeed was always okay. He was always moving. He was always scrambling, defending. And most importantly, he was always threatening. He, he never panicked under that pressure. He never let it deter him. And he kept trying to find openings, and he found one. That ninja choke was nasty. It went in and, in and out about two, three different times in that sequence before he was finally able to latch it up for good. And as much as Kakramanov was trying to escape, it just got real tight real quick, and he realized he had to get out of there. So, yeah, a big, uh, I guess you would call it a come-from-behind win for Saeed Nurmagomedov. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sticking with you, Mark, for Nurmagomedov, give me the next name that you would put him up against with that uh, Bantamweight? I'll throw out two. The more realistic choice would be Chris Gutierrez, another guy who just got a big win, two guys kind of on the come up in the division, entertaining fighters, entertaining strikers. 
I think that's a great fight. The other, while aggressive and unlikely, I still want to throw it out there, which is Dominic Cruz. For some Ooh. reason, I'm just super intrigued by how those two would match up on the feet, on the ground, everywhere. Um, for I don't know what it is. I, I really like the idea of that fight. Okay. Omar, any other names? Yeah, so I thought he was going to go Ricky Simone. I thought uh, a Ricky Simone fight would be super interesting. The pace that Ricky Simone presents, um, and that kid's ground game is nothing to be sneezed at either. So that presents some real issues, I think, for the for the game of Saeed Nurmagomedov. Um, I don't hate the Dominic Cruz one. I don't think Dominic Cruz takes it. If there's anybody that's either. super picky, if there's if there's anybody that's super picky in the UFC, I think it's Dominic Cruz is at the top of that list for sure. Um, mm. But I, I would love a Ricky Simone fight. My backup was Chris Gutierrez. Mm. Like it. Uh, you guys want? Do you have any names for uh, Kak Ramadov, or do you want to move on to one more? I'll give you one. I'll say the man that um, Saeed just beat right before him, which was Douglas Silva de Andrade. I think that is an awesome fight and a scrap. Nice. Okay. Let's move on, unless Omar has any other words to say about this fight. No, I was thinking about Cub Swanson for uh, Krokmanov. Kokramanov. I actually like that. I like that. Kromanov. Okay. God, he might just eat Cub, though, with the pace. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of where I'm at in my head. That's why I didn't really want to say it. <laughs> All right, boys. Down in the flyweight division. Uh, one more fight for us to sort of break down before we throw other fights into our lightning round. So in the flyweight division, Manel Kopp gets it done over David Dvorak by unanimous decision. 30-27, 30-27, and 29-28, all in favor of Kopp. Uh, Mark, let me toss it over to you. Your boy got another W. Give us your time. <clears throat> yes, sir keeps it rolling uh this was a weird fight and a good fight at the same time kind of we had a whole lot of david dvorak almost running around the octagon to avoid exchanging with manel cop uh it seemed like he was looking to grapple but then once he finally gets it to the mat he finds himself in a terribly deep kimura and god i don't know how the fuck he didn't tap to that kimura because it was bad and then um well, sorry. Also, I want to say, I, I was trying to think at the time, and none were coming to my mind. I don't think I've ever seen a more torqued Gamora that someone didn't tap to. Can you guys that recall That didn't any? break? That didn't break? That didn't break and someone didn't tap to. Like, it, it looked like his arm should have been shattering. But anyway, we can circle yeah. back to that because I couldn't think of one either. <sighs> um, but yeah, and then uh, cop from that point, Round two opens, he really, st even before that in round two, he had started to piece him up a bit. Round two opened more of the same. The body shots were so clean. And I know we know this, but Manel Cop is very, very good. And once he, he kind of got to work on the feet, he more or less just coasted to a one-sided victory here. And Dvorak didn't have anything for him. He couldn't get it back to the mat, and he was just stuck eating shots and, and getting pieced up. He survived. There was a couple times I thought maybe it was going to be over, so I guess a little credit to him on that, but he he had nothing for cop on the feet. Nice. Omar? I think this was a, a nice little showing from Manel Cop because he, he got three rounds to play with him. He got three rounds to show off. Striking was fantastic. Um, you know, He's gotten a lot of these... You know, he had some some early trouble when he first got in when he had a lot of hype. Um, and then he came out and missed, you know, missed weight, had a little controversy there, still finished the guy, but there's always going to be like that, Meh, but you didn't really make weight. Um, so I think this was nice. We did this one clean. He came in, he put a beating on this kid for three rounds, um, clearly took that fight, I think, without any controversy. So I think it was a good showing from Nelkop. I You know, I don't think... I think the competition could have been better, but I think it was a short notice replacement um, that Casey, that Casey Kenny kid came in as. Um, David Dvorak, you mean? That yes, sorry, I don't know why I just had that name in my head. Um, but yes, David Dvorak, I thought was a, a last minute replacement. Um, but um, Manel Cop did work, man. I, I thought he did yeah. had a fantastic performance. I just want to see the the level of competition go up the next time around. Speaking of staying with you, Omar, what level of competition would you want to see Cop go up against next? 
So I, I, where does where does the UFC have Cop now? Because I would imagine he's top ten at this point. It doesn't it work. Low top seven into that fight, so he's got to be. Yeah, so they have him at nine right now. Um, so if I had to put him up against somebody personally. I think the fight with Brandon Royval would be absolutely fantastic. Um, but I could also see a fight with uh, Matthias Nicolau also being absolutely fantastic. So oh, give me either one of those and I'm, I'm up for it. Mark? Um, yeah, he would probably love that, that rematch with Nicolau because that's the fight that he was super furious about the decision that he, that he thought he won. And we are kind of there now where you could, you could justify it. Um, yep. I will say that, um, although now that I'm thinking about it, I was going to say he could fight Alex Perez since Kai Car France got hurt, but did Perez already get matched up? Uh, oh, no, wait, sorry. Actually, I'm, I don't I'm think so. He did get matched up against Manel Cop. We already know the fight. That's what happened. Yeah. Oh. I'm fucking blanking. Yeah. Cop got Alex Perez. That is booked. So this is, we are wasting our time here right now. He um, <laughs> also on my list. <laughs> When Kai Car France got hurt, they moved Alex Perez back <laughs> off of that card, and he's fighting Manel Cop. Mm. So that's what we're doing. That is the fight. Nice. I have a lot of fight announcements that I had to get through, and that is on my list, and I okay. totally forgot. All right. It's fair. We got a lot going on here. All right, boys. In the interest of time, let's jump right into our lightning round. <clears throat> All right. Lightning round for UFC Fight Night, Cannoneer versus Strickland. Here we go. Amir Albazi knockout over Alessandro Costa. Mark, go first. Uh, Costa had some skills and some power, and he made Albazi kind of have to be careful in there. But by round two, Albazi took it over, got the first knockdown, controlled on the ground. And, I mean, the bottom line is that Albazi is very good, and he's good everywhere. And he's a guy who's ready for a big fight. So the timing on that uppercut at the end was picture perfect. He gets the win he needed to keep the momentum rolling. Omar? Yeah, man. By the time that uppercut landed, too, this man was already a tenderized piece of meat. He had been getting worked up until that point. Um, and Albazi has some heavy, heavy hands. He looks like he hits he terribly he hard. Very, um, very talented. So I, I do not envy the position Costa was in. Great win for Albazi. Okay, opening the main card of UFC Fight Night in the middleweight division, Mikhail Oleksijuk defeats Cody Brundage by knockout in the very first round. Omar, take it. Man, this is not how I saw this fight going at all. Uh, but Cody Brundage got run through, man. He got literally tanked over. Um, what a what a nasty, nasty performance from Oleksijuk from Mikhail. Fantastic, <laughs> Marco. <laughs> Let's go, baby. My boy Mikhail keeps rolling. He He's interesting in middleweight, man. He's interesting. And uh, mm. he did well in this one. Brendan was able to get the wrestling going early and kind of keep Olusheja contained. But he did well to defend. He did a great job to reverse position. And then as soon as he was in the driver's seat, it was just a matter of time. He ends up raining down bombs on Brundage. And Brundage goes out. So a great win for Olusheja. And uh, he keeps moving up here. I just want to point out really quick, this is a great example of a wrestler getting put on his back and seemingly like a fish out of water. The man was flailing with nothing, no knowledge of how to get out from under his ass for the entire round until he died. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, look, shade joke. Okay. Uh, in the feature bout of the prelims for this UFC fight night in the women's strawweight division, we had Corey McKenna defeating uh, Cheyenne Vismas by UD Omar. Take it. Corey McKenna is a dog, man. Uh, I don't really know what her ceiling is right now. I don't, I don't think this is the appropriate time to talk shit about her. She is a very unassuming woman. Doesn't seem like somebody who would make their way all the way to the top. Doesn't even seem like if you met her somewhere random that you'd be like professional fighter. Totally. I see that. Not at yeah, all. Yeah. But the girl's a worker, man, a worker, tough, and definitely put in the work against Lismas. Um, took all three rounds. I think as far as I was concerned, 
I got nothing bad to say, man. I'm 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 just curious to see where she goes from here. I'm very interested. I, I think she's great. <clears throat> Yeah, she's small for the division, which is which is tough for her. Um, but this was a good scrap. Both girls had plenty of moments where they looked good. Uh, McKenna's wrestling and and clinch work are what ended up you know edging things out in this one. But even in the loss, I thought Felismus never stopped working. She was always looking to catch something. So I, I thought they both came out looking pretty good here. Yeah, and I agree, McKenna's <clears throat> interesting. She she looked bad in her one loss to Elise Reed, like confusingly bad. But otherwise, she has been pretty impressive in, in her three wins. So I am also curious to see how far she can take this. But I, I do think the size is an issue as she keeps working her way up. Okay. All right. Still now in the prelims, Matthew Samuelsberger defeated Jake Matthews by unanimous decision. Mark, go. What a weird fight to watch. First of all, it hurt my soul because I'm such a Jake Matthews believer. And I was so hyped after his last performance uh, against Fialio, thinking, here it comes. We're finally hitting the, you know, the point where Jake Matthews is breaking through here. Um, but a weird fight to watch because Jake Matthews loses it and he gets dropped three times, yet he looks better in much larger chunks of the fight than Matt Semmelsberger did. And that's because Jake honestly is the more talented guy and he should have won this fight. But, geez, I love you, Jake. But if you're going to fight this way where you're trying to, like, slip and rip and all this you got to keep the left hand up sometimes and block the right hook. I mean, he was just sitting there for that right all, all three times he got dropped. It was it was a right hook with, with his hand down. So he's going to have to clean it up a bit. Um, he let three punches change the whole fight. Went down all three times that he got landed flush on, and uh, it's a disappointing outcome for him because he looked good other than those three punches, and it's a huge win mm-hmm. for Matt Semmelsberger's career. Omar. Yeah, that one was sad to watch, man. Um, had some high expectations for what, what Matthews could have done. You saw shades of it in that fight, but but very few and far between. Um, and, and there's a part of me, you know, dude is tough, though, because the, the shots that Semmelsberger did end up landing on him that put him on his ass would have probably put a lot of people out completely. Um, totally. And he probably should have went out a couple times that he just, you know, gritted his teeth and kind of pushed through and tried to grab legs and all this other stuff and, and, you know, survived it. But there was some surviving going on. There was not, that was not a flash knockdown. Like he was hurt. There was pain. The and first one looked bad. like, yeah. And it didn't really get any better, man. Like every one of those hits, his eyes rolled back. Like he was looking into space when he got hit. Um, they weren't great. So, I mean, credit to Sunnelsberger for being able to put on a performance like that, but like I still think Jake Matthews is a better fighter overall, but sure. he just he just didn't it just didn't happen in that fight, man. It sucks. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. Uh, this fight went down at a catch weight of 158 and a half pounds. Rafa Garcia defeated uh, Mahashate 30 27s across the board. Omar, sticking with you, take it. Yeah, what a gross ass fight this ended up being. Um, they were covered and I, were they both bleeding at this point? I don't even remember now. No, it was they just were both Garcia. bleeding. It was just Garcia. I mean, my, I mean, my I mean, shot might've had like a little cut or two, but he wasn't like dripping. He wasn't all. gushing. That, it was yeah. all Garcia. They were covered in blood by the end of that. It makes it grosser it that the man was covered in somebody else's blood entirely on his sure. body. It was nasty. Um, but it was a scrap, man. It was definitely a scrap. Garcia, Garcia put in a lot of work, a lot of activity, and I think what really made the difference was uh, Mahashat not being able to find the distance and not being able to keep his distance properly. There were a lot of moments where his strikes and his attacks closed the distance, and he never got back outside. So it allowed Garcia to take advantage, take him down, throw you know some hooks or elbows or whatever the case was. Um, he gave him a lot of opportunities throughout that fight to do that, and, and I think it just, just added up. Yeah, man. Mark? Yeah, Mahashata always looked dangerous, but Garcia is just such a dog, and he really made the wrestling and the aggression that he had on the mat work for him. Um, but, yeah, the main topic was certainly the blood. What a friggin' cut this was on Garcia. And he found that after the fight that he lost 20% of his blood out there, which is nuts to even think about. And I that's don't know nice. how you lose 20% of your true? blood. Dude, that's what they told him. They said he urgently had to have whatever the fuck they did to him because he lost 20% of his blood. Oh my God. Probably had a transfusion. They probably had to put blood back in him. Maybe. That's crazy. 
Um, I don't know how you lose that much of your blood and still function well enough to win a fight, but I guess you can. So, yeah, it's a tough, okay, gritty, gutty win for, for Garcia. Okay. Uh, two more. In the welterweight di division, uh, let's see. Oh, I forgot. Somebody help me with this last name. I'm going to butcher it. Fak Fakhradinov. Fakhradinov. Renat Fakhradinov defeated Brian Battle by, unman by unanimous decision. Mark, take it. I I teased that we may be looking at this outcome when I mentioned this as a fight to highlight last week, and fuck, Renat walked over Brian Battle from bell to bell. This was an absolute wrestling cl clinic, and then in round three, <clears throat> Renat even drops him for good measure, and honestly, I wonder how long the list is of UFC welterweights who could have stopped Renat's wrestling on this night because he looked like a man who not many humans could could have stopped. So it's going to be interesting to see these guys deal with him as he moves his way up here. Omar. Yeah, man. Uh, Brian Battle did not look great. He looked outclassed, frankly. Um, I think he kind of saw... I think he kind of saw what his ceiling was currently because not being able to stop takedowns and being kind of dominated like that at this point, especially now that everybody's seen it, everybody's going to do it if they can. Uh, yeah. And I think a lot of people in the top of those divisions, if they have to, they definitely will. So the one thing I will say about Brian Battles, he doesn't seem like the type who's going to go back and continue to do the same thing. I would imagine he goes back and he tries to, you know, add something to his game to make him better. Um, I know he said in the cage to uh, Fakhr Dinov that, uh, that he's coming for him, that he'll be back, and he wants an another rematch with him at some point down the line, um, which I respect. You know what I mean? He doesn't, yeah, doesn't sure. want to just take that loss and just leave it like that. You know, he wants that one back. And But I think he knows. I, you know, we've joked about him and his, his math skills, but I think he knows and is smart enough to know that he can't come in there with the same shit. Like, he's got to make a significant change in the way that he fights in order for him to be able to beat guys like this so hopefully we see that out of him in the future um but a great great performance from fucker dinov okay one more sergey morozov defeats journey newsom by unanimous decision omar stick it with you take it yeah um it was a good fight i honestly i think out of all the fights that ended up happening in this uh this night i was probably the least impressed out of this one maybe mark has a different take um uh, but it, it, it wasn't my favorite fight of the night. Um, but I give credit to Morozov for doing what he did. Um, I think I had him winning all three rounds in that fight. It's good for him. Marv, take us home. Um, Morozov's good, man. He, he's got skills everywhere. He shows it in every fight. you got to be pretty good to beat him. His UFC losses are Umar Namagomedov and Douglas, Douglas Silva de Andrade. And that one was a wild fight that he was winning. So Jerry Newsom just isn't high enough level, and he couldn't stop Morozov from working his games, specifically his wrestling. Um, once Morozov was connected to him, he really had a hard time getting him off, and Morozov works his way to a nice win. All right, boys, that does it for this week's lightning round and recap. <laughs> Portion of the show. UC Fight Night. Cannoneer versus Strickland. And now let's go right into our update from Mark's very own rankings system, which we affectionately call the Prio rankings. Mark? All right. We got a few this week. Four risers and two fallers. Um, working down, we will start with Armin Sarukian. Not a huge rise, but he was on the marquee, so I felt like it was significant to spotlight. He was my number 11 lightweight. He now moves up to my number 8 lightweight. I was really tempted to put him at number seven, considering I thought he beat Matos Gamrot, but I can't cheat the actual results, so he is behind Gamrot, and he is number eight. Um, next one, Manel Kopp keeps moving up. He moves from number 11 in my flyweight rankings up to number seven. So he is right there now. As we know, he's matched with, with Alex Perez, and if he wins that one, Manel Kopp is going to be truly in this title mix. Uh, next one, and this is the biggest jump of the evening, and by the evening, I mean the fights that were two weeks ago that we're catching up on right now. Um, Matt Semmelsberger was my number 44-ranked welterweight. He is now my number 24-ranked welterweight. 
Big jump for him, taking out Jake Matthews. I still don't know if I believe he's this good, but got to rank him based off the results, and uh, he gets himself a big win. So he moves up 20 spots. And the last one is Renat Fakradinov. Moves from number 59 to number 49 in my welterweight rankings as he walks over Brian Battle, as we just mentioned. Uh, the two fallers, one is Jake Matthews. Had him at number 20 in my welterweight ranks. He is now down at number 25. That loss definitely hurts his momentum a bit. And the other is David Dvorak. Uh, he was my number 8 flyweight, and he falls down to number 12. And that is it for the Yikes. updates this week. Nice, nice. All right. Well, let's go right into our next segment, Inside the MMA Sphere with Omar, letting us know the news and updates outside of the cage. Omar. Indeed. Gentlemen, welcome back. Well, welcome. Welcome back. Welcome back. There we go. Uh, all right. So, uh, obviously, we've got quite a bit to go over. We've had a couple of weeks off here or a week off, but basically like two weeks off. Um, so a lot that we need to get into, so let's jump right into it. Um, our top story of the day is an unfortunate one. Stefan, the American psycho Bonner has officially passed away. Um, apparently from a presumed heart attack or heart complications while he was working. Um, if you've been following MMA for a while, um, or have heard our, our show over the year, um, you would have heard that Stefan Bonner has had medical issues in the past, had had kind of a run in during COVID with the hospital and um, seems like he was seeking opiates and, you know, painkillers and things like that. So, you know, it seems like he, he was going through the struggle that a lot of uh, Americans have been going through when it comes to pain management um, and getting addicted to opioids. Um, and either it might've caught up to him, it might've damaged his body more than, you know, what was going on originally, who knows? Um, there is no real official cause of death as of right now. Um, just, just the heart complications, you know, themselves, that was a quote. Um, but, but again, if you've been following, you know, the MMA stuff, the MMA life, you've seen that Stefan Bonner hasn't been okay for quite some time. So sad to hear that he passed away like this. Um, the man, if you don't know who he is, if you're newer to the MMA world, Stefan Bonner is the reason why the UFC is even as big as it is. Um, the first ending of the first season of Tough is a fight with him and Stefan Bonner, or with uh, Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin. That fight, to this day, is still kind of one of the most legendary fights ever. Not only was it a scrap, but it, you know, it brought the eyes of people who at that point hadn't really seen or cared about MMA or had misconceptions about MMA and what that lifestyle was and you know, the backyard fighting and the brutality and this and the that. Um, they did a lot of work to try to change the image of MMA into more of a sport as to what it is now. And mm -hmm. Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin were the guys who took that first big step together to, to, to make that happen. Um, and if it wasn't for them, from what I understand of how that, that story goes, the UFC would not have lasted much longer after that physically, like mm. money. So um, they saved the day. They saved the day, and, and I think it's because of them we're able to reap all the rewards of all the fights that we've seen. Uh, people like John Jones and Conor McGregor and all of them wouldn't have had a platform like this had it not been for those two guys. So, yeah. Stefan Bonner will be missed, man. I wish that he had been treated a lot better. Um, I wish that he had gotten the help that he needed. And I hope anybody who's in this situation doesn't go out the same way and, and gets that help sooner rather than later. So, RIP to Stefan Bonner. Yeah, for sure. You said it well. I don't feel like there's a lot to add to that. Um, obviously, some unfortunate circumstances late in his life, but uh, absolutely a trailblazer for the sport of MMA, for the company that we know as the UFC today. And uh, we would not be in the, the mainstream MMA place that we are without the contributions of, of Stefan Bonner. He, not to say he was any legendarily talented fighter but he was a part of one of the most important fights that ever happened yeah, yeah. he was uh he turned in one of the most legendary fights or one half of it and might be the mo the most important legendary fight in ufc history and uh for that we thank him and we'll miss him 
He also had a great personality. Like he was a funny guy. It's it's interesting. Both he and Forrest Griffin, both kind of yep. had big personalities. Were both humorous guys, and uh, you know they both have done other things after MMA. Forrest obviously uh, not Forrest. Uh, Stefan obviously held on to fighting a bit longer, and he fought for the belt. He fought Anderson at one point. Uh, Forrest held the belt briefly, and uh, sucks, man. Shitty way to go. Sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Forty-five years old. I think their personalities actually played a big role in the in the significance that they had because they were both, you know, they weren't like scary, crazy fighters. They were both kind of like bros. They were like regular guys. Totally. I think that was most of the case for Tough One in general. You had a lot of different personalities, but a lot of them could be attributed to that, you know, hardworking American lifestyle kind of thing, you know? Yeah. I think everybody could have, could kind of relate to a lot of those guys that were in that house, you know, whether you were a little crazy like Diego or, you know, kind of like your, your, your back town boy like Forrest, you know, everybody kind of had their thing. Okay. All right. Uh, next on the list uh a little update so for those of you who have been following uh some of the news regarding um this fucking guy with the gambling i should have wrote down his name i don't know james kraus james so for those of you who have been following the james kraus stories um you know you may have remembered that any fighters that were associated with james kraus being coached by james kraus would not be able to compete while they are being coached or or representing james kraus in any way um that included the champion, former champion, Brandon Moreno. Uh, so for his upcoming fight, we all knew that he was going to have to find something else. We didn't know what that was going to be. We've all been waiting for the news, and here it is. Brandon Moreno is now with Fortis MMA under Saif Saud. So that'll be an interesting to see if that makes any difference in his game, if this game changes uh, significantly or makes him better or worse. We'll see. Um, I'm hoping for the best. I'm a big Moreno fan, so I'm hoping he takes the belts again this time, but all in due time. Speaking of pay-per-views, the UFC done raised the price of the pay-per-views again. So Crazy. Now the new standard price to be raised in 2023 will be going from $74.99, which is what it is now, to $79.99. So it is now $80 a pay-per-view. Plus tax, so it's like 83, 84 or some shit. Uh, so, gross. I'm going to stick to my Buffalo Wild Wings for that, because that's nonsense. Um, yeah. I think I'm going to start fucking streaming, because this is getting absurd. Legally, of course he means. FBI man. Legally. <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> Kai Kara France is out of UFC's 284 uh, event with an undisclosed injury. So now that is Robert Whitaker and Kai Car France out of that Perth event. Um, not a lot of Perth going on in that card, so it's very yeah, sad. Yeah, got fucked bad. Literally yeah. built it around Volk, Whitaker, Kai, and two of them are gone. Now we just need to hope that Volk shows up and he's not injured yeah. or anything crazy. He will. Fucking Volk always shows up. Uh, next on the list... Nemkov is also injured, and the fight with him and Romero has been called off. Oh. Johnny Eblen versus Anatoly Tuk has been added to the title, has been Tukov. added for the title. Oh, it it that was autocorrect. It, auto, Anatoly it says it says Tuk T O O K. Oh, he's been added to the title for, or to the card for the title, uh, so they will be taking the spot for that fight. Pretty sad because I really wanted to see that Romero fight, but it is what it is. Uh, a little bit more Bellator news. Sarah McMahon officially signs with Bellator. Uh, she said she wanted to test the free agency market and see what the pay discrepancy was, if she could make any more money outside of there, grass is greener kind of deal. And it seems like she found it. She said she's making a good amount of money now in Bellator compared to what she was making in the UFC, so more power to her. Oh, yeah? Um uh, Seems her. to be the dude. Everybody who I see going Bellator when they have the option to stay in the UFC almost always says they're making a lot more money. So, yeah, Bellator got the pockets, man. They just don't want to spend it on nobody people. 
But coming over from the UFC, you got a better shot at getting a nice little paycheck than others. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's get to some fight announcements. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of them. I mean, you can Corey Anderson. Uh, who's the other one? The other girl that fought Ronda. Um, she got like arm barred. Well, they all got arm barred. Well, okay, Carmouche is a good one though. Kat Zingano is who Kat's I was talking about, but Carmouche is another one that's actually a great example as well. I mean, look at her career just in general, let alone what she probably made just to go over to the Bell Tour in the first place. So, uh, all right, let's get into these fight announcements here. Uh, Priscilla Cachoeira versus Sarge Eubanks has been added to UFC Vegas 67 on January 14th. Derek Lewis versus Sergey Spivak has been rebooked for UFC Vegas' main event on February 4th. Along with that fight, there will be Marcin Tibura versus Blagoy Ivanov. And OSP versus Philip Linz has been added to UFC's Vegas 69 card on February 18th. Along with Lena Landsberg versus Myra Buena Silva. Aaron Blanchfield versus Talia Santos, which is Let's go. A plus, A plus. Uh, and last but not least, headlining the card, Marlon Vera versus Corey Sanhagen, because yeah. let's fucking go. Oh, God. Um, I fucking hate that it's in the apex, dude. Yeah, it but the part of me wants... I feel like that fight needs I, to end. I really want to hear the violence, though. I want, I want to hear all the impact for that fight. Fair, fair, that fair. shit's going to be... <laughs> Audible. <laughs> uh, Andre Feely versus Lucas Almeida has been added to USC Vegas 70 card on February 25th. Andre Muniz versus Brendan Allen has been added to UFC Vegas card on February 25th as well. Wow. And Augusto Sakai versus Dantel Mize has been also okay. has also been added to that. Wow, card. big step down for Sakai. Sheesh. I guess that's what happens yeah. when you lose a bunch in a row. And not great either. He, it's not like the fights were great. No. Um, okay. Next on the list, Julian Marquez versus Mark Andre Barrio has been added to UFC's 285 card on March 4th in London, and Derek Brunson versus Drikas Duplessis has been added to that card as well. Nice. Uh, Mario Batista versus Guido Ninja Canetti has been added to the Vegas card on March 11th, along with JJ Aldrich and Arian Lip- Lipsky. Uh, oh, Marvin yeah, Vittori see. versus fucking another one with the autocorrect. Oh, funny. It says Arian. A R I N E. Lipsky. Ariane Lipsky, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fucking Christ. All right. Uh, Marvin Vittori versus Roman Delites has been added to the UFC 286 card on March 18th, along with Joanne Wood versus Luana Carolina. Another Joanne Carolina? Wood. Carolina? I don't know. It might be Carolina. I'm not sure. Uh, and Luana Jake Carolina. Hadley versus is Carolina. Luana Carolina. Is that who you said? Luana. Yeah, Luana Carolina. Yeah, Carolina. Yeah. Okay. And Jake Hadley versus Malcolm Gordon. All added to UFC's 286 card. Uh, Chidi Njikawani versus Albert Durayev has been added to the San Antonio card on March 25th. Holly Holm versus Yana Kunitskaya has also been added to that card, which is a big step up, I think, for Yana Kunitskaya. Uh, Alex Perez versus Manel Kopp, as we alluded to earlier, added to the March 25th card in San Antonio. And last but not least, Sean Brady versus Michelle Pereira has been added to that card in San Antonio as well. That is all we have for you. That was a long one. Let's get into it's this good. card. All right, boys. Well, we do not have a UFC card this weekend. We do not have a one championship card this weekend. Uh we have a fun one. Uh, a, a unique, a unique thing this weekend. Two promotions pitting their best against each other. Those being Bellator and Ryzen. So we have Bellator MMA versus Ryzen FF. New Year's Eve, December thirty first, in Japan, at the Saitama Super Arena. Here. We go headliner AJ McKee versus Roberto de Souza. Uh, we're going to discuss five of these fights. Let us begin. 
with the fight that is opening the main card in the lightweight division. Well, not, not a division, but uh, in the weight class of 155 pounds. Let me pull this up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oops. Let's see. Yes, sir. Okay, God's You're right over there? Yeah, man. I'm just pulling my, my info up. Gazi Rabadinov, am I saying that wrong? Uh, that's right. Thank you. 29 years old, out of Russia, the fighter for uh, Bellator, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yep. He's 18-4 and four as a pro with one draw. Coming off of four wins, uh, undefeated under the Bellator banner. Taking on Koji Takada. Takeda. Probably saying that wrong. Takeda. Out of yeah. Saitama, Japan, 27 years old, 15 and 3 as a pro. Uh, two fight win streak coming into this epic c card. Mark, start us off. Anything you want to say about this matchup at 155? Bellator versus Ryzen? <clears throat> yeah, so I'll just say real quick, I should have said it, I guess, when you were introing the event, but this is a very cool event to me. Um, you kind of have a prelims because Ryzen, uh, Ryzen is having its own event before this that is almost serving as the prelims to this card and then you move into the <laughs> versus bellator portion which is these five fights but i love the fact that uh scott coker said that when he came to this agreement with um i'm forgetting the name of the head of uh ryzen but he said like you know I'll, I'll bring some of my more like middle guys or whatever and the dude who was the head of ryzen was like fuck that like you bring your top guys i'm putting in my top guys and we're seeing who's better and Scott Coker was kind of like, are you sure that's what you want me to do? Because, you know, general presumption is the Bellator guys are better here. And I believe they are favored in every single fight, as we'll look through these. But I just love that, that, that that's how this thing worked out. Um, so that is cool to me. And then this fight is, is a little bit of the outlier to that, because obviously Bellator brought four studs, and then they kind of brought Godzi. But I think it's because they're trying to shine some light on him here. I think they think that he's a possible future contender. Uh, he is a guy who beat J.J. Wilson recently, which means something to me because I think J.J. Wilson is very talented. And he's favored here. He's minus 360 against Koji Takeda, who's plus 270. Um, God, he's one inch taller. He's going to have a three-inch reach advantage. Uh, his opponent, Koji, is a quality wrestler. He can strike a bit, too. He's quick. He kind of fights like hands down at times, that type of style. But Gazi's not terribly different. He's a wrestler first, but he's a threat on the feet as well, and he has shown that. He's finished fights. Uh, and I think he he is probably going to be a level above here. Takeda is a scrambly guy. He's not easy to control. But I think Gazi can, for the most part. <clears throat> he's got Habib in his corner. It's hard to pick against Coach Habib these days. Uh, although, and this is a note for every fight on this card, which is interesting. There is no cage. These are in a ring with ropes. Oh, well. So it is going to be maybe a bit harder for guys such as Godzi and other guys who are looking to control to actually maintain that control uh, without the cage. So it, it'll be great that it may also be harder for guys to get up without the cage. So it could work either way. We'll see. We'll see how this happens. Um, but I do think Godzi is the better fighter here. I think as long as he fights smart on the feet, and I think he will, I think he can ground Takeda and, and control him and beat him up a bit. I will say Godzi UD. Okay. Uh, Omar? Yeah, so Takeda is kind of an unorthodox fighter, but I kind of agree with Mark when it comes to um, the Rab Rabotanoff side of things because you've got... Just say Godzi. You've got a, so much easier. Godzi. Um, <laughs> you've got a guy who came from the Abdul Manap camp, right? Even before Team Khabib, he was Team Abdul Manap. And that guy, we already know that man, trains people like like killers. Um, I think the one thing that's interesting about him is that, you know, although we've seen guys like Khabib and guys like Islam take to the technique uh, of that camp significantly well, the one thing I will say is uh, Ghazi does seem like he's a bit more in tune with his athleticism. Um, you know, you could say that, you know, people like Islam and Khabib are very strength oriented in the way that their styles are. You know, they use their technique, obviously, but you can see the force that they put in with what they do in that cage. Uh, there's a lot of strength behind what they do. We've heard guys talk time and time again 
about how Khabib was the strongest guy they felt in the cage, or Islam, you know, can't believe he's that strong and all this other shit. Um, but Rabdam, uh, but Gazi has more of an athleticism, I think, than a lot of those guys. His technique may not be on par, but he's definitely got that. Um, I think he's good when it comes to the double legs, and I think the one thing you made a point about it not being inside of the cage, um, I think Gazi has shown his his ability to get takedowns in the center of the cage, not needing to prop people up uh, in order to take people down. And I think that makes him very dangerous. Um, I don't know if Takeda's fought somebody with the type of wrestling style um, that Gazi brings. Um, and as fun as I think Takeda can be, I just think he's going to get outworked. So I'm going to also go with uh, Gazi by unanimous decision. Okay. I honestly don't know enough about these rising guys to make a pick. So I'm just going to say Bell Tour runs the table. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Okay, next fight up is going down at 135 pounds. Juan Archuleta taking on Su Chu Kim. So Su Chu Kim, 31 years old, out of Seoul, South Korea. 18 and 6 as a professional with 6 knockouts, 5 submissions. Uh, he's never been knocked out himself. He has been subbed. He is riding back-to-back -back wins coming into this weekend new year's eve bash uh he'll be standing across from one juan the spaniard archuleta the 35 year old out of california 26 and 4 as a pro with 11 knockouts uh coming off of a win over enrique barzola this past october uh omar give us your assessment first so kim Kim is seemingly a guy who may not be the most technical person on the block, um, but the kid brings a lot of different attributes that are a real problem when you put them all together. His forward movement, his aggression, uh, his ability to, to throw damage. He sacrifices a lot of control, but he's very aggressive when it comes to uh, ground damage and throwing ground strikes, and he has a lot of heavy pressure when he comes forward. Uh, a lot of those things have allowed him to, I think, circumvent the fact that he may not be the most technical when it comes to his striking or even when it comes to the ground game. Um, there are a lot of instances where, you know, he'll go for a takedown, he'll, he'll get the takedown, but he'll choose to try and do damage over maintaining ground control and eventually will lose it, have thrown strikes, has done a little bit of damage, but he'll lose the, the, the position and we're kind of back to square one and, and, and scrapping again. So um, as good as I think he is, I think Juan Archuleta is just significantly more technical than he is, and I think in all areas. I think a lot of the, the opportunities that uh, Kim allows for himself with the way he fights, I think Archuleta is going to be able to capitalize off pretty badly. Um, so I'm going to go with Juan Archuleta by KO round two. Okay, Mark, give it to us. <clears throat> all right, Juan is favored here. He is minus 175. Su Chul Kim is plus 145. So this is pretty close. One of the closer ones on, might actually be the closest one on the card as I'm trying to think here. I think it is. Um, this is an interesting matchup, man. Um, Omar gave you a nice rundown there. Su, Su Chul Kim is good. He's the former double champ at Bantamweight and Featherweight for Road FC. He is very well-rounded. He'll outstrike you. He'll take you down. He'll sub you. He's opportunistic. He's kind of got like a Muay Thai style. Uh, but across from him, he's got a guy who may be just as well-rounded as him, if not even arguably more, depending how you want to really break it down. Because Juan Archuleta is a really underrated wrestler. He can scramble for days. He brings dangerous striking. I think he's probably going to be the quicker fighter in there. And I also think he's going to be the guy who packs more power. And I think that firepower is going to be a factor for him. Yeah. And I even think that if the striking is maybe not going exactly how he wants it to go, I think he can be safe enough and smart enough on the mat to use the wrestling to at least control and kind of change the speed of the fight and, and where the fight's taking place if need be. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to lead toward Juan uh, pulling out of UD. And remember, this is a guy who beat Patchy Mix, who looks unreal right now, who was doing well against Rafion Stotts before getting knocked out. So... Suchu Kim is an inter interesting fighter, but I got to roll with Juan here, so I will say Juan Archuleta UD. Okay. Okay, marching right along here. Next fight up in the flyweight division. We have uh, two more until we get to the main event. 
Kyoji Horiguchi taking on Hi uh, Hiromasa Oigikubu. Sorry if I'm butchering that name. My mistake. Horiguchi. Oigikubu. You were no, close. In no introduction really needed. 32 year old out of Japan as well. Record stands at 30 and 5 as a pro with 15 knockouts. Add four subs to that. Oh boy, my man's a finisher. Uh, that is a 60 plus percent finish rate for Horiguchi. Uh, he is coming off of a win over uh, Yuto Hokamura in Ryzen back in September of this year. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hiramasa, he is 35. Uh, very close to my birthday. 25 and 6 as a pro. Add two draws to that. 18 decisions. Uh, only one knockout win on, on, on his career. Uh, he's coming off of a loss against So Chul Kim. Uh, Mark, give us first this time your uh, your assessment of this matchup and, and pick it up. So this is the widest one on the card. Uh, Kyoji is minus 600 here. Uh, Hiromasa is plus 425. This one doesn't really fit the bill of Bellator versus Ryzen, considering Kyoji is also a Ryzen guy. He's fought a ton of fights for them. His last fight was in Ryzen. So it's like, feels kind of weird that he's representing Bellator here. But um, it is what it is. And this is actually a trilogy fight. Granted, it is 2-0 Horiguchi at this point. Um, the uh, His opponent, Hiromasa Ogikubo, I think is how you say it, may actually be known to some American fans because he was on tough. He lost to Tim Elliott in the final of the flyweight season when they were trying to find a, ch a challenger for DJ. Um, so he looked pretty good there. He never got his contract for one reason or another, but he's been a solid fighter over in Ryzen. I just don't think he has the right game to beat Horiguchi, as we've seen in two prior fights. He's a great wrestler. But without a size advantage, I don't think you can out-wrestle Kyoji Horiguchi. I just think he's impossible to keep down unless you're a much larger man like a patchy mix like he showed in Bellator. <clears throat> so I don't think his game works. I think Horiguchi has him outgunned on the feet, speed, technique, power. I think it's all Kyoji. I am going to say that it goes the full 15, though. So I will say Kyoji Horiguchi UD. Omar, any words you want to say about this? Yeah, uh, Oji Kumbo Kubo also uh, went to decision with Pantoja and actually won that fight. He won, right? On top? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was just before he lost to Tim Elliott. Um, he's a decent fighter, man. He's not a bad fighter. I, I do think Kyoji probably takes the cake when it comes to the speed and the athleticism there. Um, Oji Kumbo, though, brings uh, some interesting takedowns and as well as his timing with his leg kicks. His leg kicks are pretty damn good. And again, somebody like Horiguchi, that might be a tool that might be fun to have. Um, it could definitely slow down Horiguchi. It could stop a lot of his bouncy shit that, that he likes to do. Um, I do think, though, that that it, eventually it'll kind of be all for naught. I do think Horiguchi is just a better fighter overall. Um, and uh, I think he's going to take all five rounds, but I do think that it will be a decision. I don't think there'll be a finish in this one. Horiguchi by unanimous decision. Only three rounds. There's only three rounds? All of them are. What the hell's going on here? Yeah. It's nonsense. <laughs> These should all be five rounds. I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> yes. Every promotion versus... Yeah, I thought, promotion unless I'm wrong, I thought the main <clears> event <throat> was five, but I don't... I think I remember looking and even the main event is not five. Now I want to check again. What? Yeah, it's not. Everything is three. What? Yep. Okay. Co-main so event time at 145 pounds. Patricio Pitbull taking on Kleber Coit. Herbs. Sorry again. Unfamiliar with these guys. Uh, Pitbull really needing no introduction. 35 years old. Out of Natal, Brazil. He is 34 and 5 as a pro. With a almost 70% finish rate with 11 knockouts. Add 12 submissions to that. He's coming off back-to-back -back wins against AJ McKee and Adam Borch. Kleber. Kleber. 33, Kleber, excuse me. 33-year-old, thank you. Out of Brazil. 31-5 and five as a pro with one draw. 
27 wins by submission. That is an 87% submission win rate. Yeah. Goodness. Uh, he might know a thing or two about grappling. He's riding a seven-fight win streak coming into this weekend. A tall test for Pitbull, I'd say, just on the numbers. Omar, talk to us about this matchup and give us a pick. So, Kleber... Kleber. Maybe I'm in the minority. Koike, Koike, I think is how they pronounce it. Yep. Um, I might be in the minority with this one. I'm not sure if, if my take is a hot take or not. Kleber's got some, he's got some good range. He's got some good front, uh, some good kicks and good lengthy kicks. Um, he's got good wrestling. He's got a good head and arm, uh, head and arm choke. Um, his Brazilian jiu-jitsu is obviously what he's known for. That's his bread and butter, his peanut butter and jelly. Like that's, that's his lifeline right there is that, that jiu-jitsu. Um, he's got some S rank jiu-jitsu and he's got some fucking F rank striking. Okay. That striking is not even mids. That that's lower than that. So, as good as I think this man's jujitsu is, and obviously the man's got a resume of sorts to back up exactly how good his jujitsu is. It, it's not Pitbull is not the one for that bullshit. I I actually think this is the worst matchup on the card. If we're being wholly honest, I think they've just put this kid in there with a murderer who knows how to play the same game that he's exempt uh, that he's uh, exceptional at. So I think all the, all the, the, the advantage that he would normally have, I feel like under the risen banner uh, with guys who may not come from a lineage of grappling to that level. I think that shit's about to go out the window now with Pitbull, because I don't think Pitbull is going to be susceptible to a lot of the, the jujitsu games that he's able to play off in, in Japan. So, hmm. I think the boy is going to get knocked down. I think he's going to get hurt real bad because the striking is not it. You, I, I would never recommend anybody with that level of striking to go in there against somebody like Pitbull. Um, but point. here we are. It is what it is. I mean, Pitbull by KO via Ivan Drago punch. I mean, he's he's going to kill him. He's gonna he's gonna really hurt this kid. It's going to be bad. Like the video highlight from it is probably going to be bad, but. But Pitbull definitely by KO. I wouldn't even obviously be surprised if he doesn't make it out of the first round. So there it is. Okay. Mark? I do not disagree. Uh, and the odds are pretty wide. Pitbull's minus 425. Uh, Kleber is plus 325. Um, kind of the same theme in both of the big fights here, where it's this absolute top tier Bellator fighter trying not to get submitted. Uh, in this one, as you guys have laid out, he's stepping in there across from a man who is definitely a submission wizard. Uh, Pitbull's going to be at a four-inch height and five-inch reach disadvantage, but what else is new for Pitbull? And it's not so significant here because Kleber isn't looking to strike anyway. He's looking to get it to the mat and, and tap Pitbull, and I agree with Omar. I think the problem for him is that Pitbull's not that guy. He ain't tapping Patricio Pitbull, and we'll see if we end up eating these words somehow. Yeah, right. But Pitbull's got nasty jits. We just don't see it as much these yeah. days because he's too busy winning fights on the feet. Sure. But he's got nasty jits himself, and I, I can't see him getting caught here. I really can't. Even if it gets into a grappling situation, I think he can get up. He can get up and out of it if he needs to. And on the feet, again, I agree with Omar. I think Kleber is hopelessly outgunned. So I think what this comes down to is just how aggressive Pitbull is. If he wants to be very aggressive, I think it's probably round one knockout. If he maybe fights a little more calm, countery, I think it's round two knockout. So I will say a round two knockout for Pitbull. All right. All right, boys. Main event time, last one. Uh, main event for this very cool, very unique end of your New Year's Eve car, Bellator MMA versus Ryzen FF. Going down at 155 pounds. A.J. McKee representing Bellator. Taking on Roberto de Souza for Ryzen. So de Souza, the 33-year-old out of Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's 14-1 and one as a pro. Four knockouts, 10 submissions. 
So that is zero decision wins. So all finishes for Souza. His only loss, a knockout, uh, back in 2019 against Johnny Case under the Rising Banner. So he's riding a five-fight win streak coming into the weekend. Taking on the former Bellator uh, lightweight champ and AJ McKee. Or is it, he's a featherweight champ. And then he went up. McKee was the former featherweight champ. Yes. Yeah, former featherweight champ. Excuse me. <clears throat> McKee, and, the 27-year-old out of Long Beach, California. Lightweight champ. Yes. Uh, 19 and one as a pro, six knockouts, seven subs. His only loss, a decision loss against a, an opponent that he finished in the fight right before, being uh, Patricio Pitbull. Uh, Mark, let's start with you this time. Give us your take of uh, McKee versus De Souza. All right, so pretty tight odds for the main event. I mean, not terribly tight, but tighter than most of the others we've said. AJ McKee is minus two forty-five. Roberto De Souza is plus one eighty-five. Uh, this is the one for me. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be surprising. We'll see what Omar take is. Uh, of all the fights on this card, this is the one where I think Ryzen has the best chance. Which seems crazy to say when we're talking about AJ McKee as good as he is, but Roberto De Souza is very real. The man is fourteen and one. He of of all the Ryzen fighters on this card, I was. I'm v vaguely familiar with some of the other guys, kind of brushed myself up on them. Roberto de Souza, I know and follow what, what he does. He's a guy, if you pull up world rankings, he's in like that 2025 range in most lightweight world rankings. Like he, he's a respected guy. He's 14 and one. You mentioned his loss to Johnny case. He avenged that loss. He finished Johnny case. As you said, he's finished every single one of his wins. The guy's a fucking wizard on the mat. He's like a spider monkey. He is legit. Just as a, as another example, Tofik Musayev has one loss in eight years. This is the guy who's probably about to fight for the Bellator lightweight title. His one loss in eight years, Roberto de Souza, triangle. So he is legit, and this is interesting because, as I've said, his specialty is grappling, and A.J. McKee is a very willing grappler. Like, even when A.J. shouldn't be grappling, like <laughs> how we thought with Spike Carlisle, like, sit back, pick him apart, no need to get into crazy scrambles – he ends up grappling a shit ton because it's like he can't help it. He just it's it's in him that he has to grapple. So it makes this very intriguing because I don't know if he can resist it. And uh, De Souza is a willing striker as well. He, he's got some some pop. He doesn't have the technique that AJ McKee has. And for that reason, I think McKee's game plan should be wholly anti grappling because he should be able to lean on a striking advantage. The entire way through, he's quicker. He is cleaner. Um, they're the same height, but I can't find a reach for De Souza. I got to think McKee is longer. I'd be surprised if he's not. So he will have that in his corner. I just think he can kind of pick apart De Souza if he wanted to and kind of use his wrestling defensively. I could even see De Souza pull guard if things were going bad. It could get interesting. Um, but I just, I'm, I don't know. Like, I, I want to pick AJ because I believe he's the better overall fighter and that, like, in a correct MMA world, he wins this fight. But I, I'm, I, I'm having doubts about if I can trust him to not fuck around in the grappling. And De Souza is a guy who will catch you if you fuck around. So I, I'm nervous about it. I'll be on the edge of my seat. I got to hope AJ McKee can get this done. I'm going to say AJ McKee UD for the Bellator sweep. Omar, take us home. So, believe it or not, I actually agree with you. I think this is the closest fight out of the huh. entire five-fight lineup. Um, I think so, – so, the way that we kind of talked about uh, Kleber kind of having this S-rank jiu-jitsu and, like, this F-rank striking, I don't feel that way about DeSouza. I think DeSouza's Same. striking is is better. It's not – it's it's not elite level striking as far as I'm concerned, but it is better, um, and it's, it's it's been effective. I mean, he's he has some knockouts. He's never gone to a decision, you know, for better or for worse. Um, so he he does know how to string combinations together. I think what helps him in those moments when it comes to his striking um, is his nonstop action. A lot of times, guys will stop at two three punches. The man keeps going. He just keeps going. 
Uh, and eventually he'll land something, he'll drop somebody, and then he'll kind of go down to the ground and play down there. But um, his strikes are effective. And, you know, just like you said, Mark, the AJ's game is so well-rounded that sometimes he's a little too comfortable being well-rounded in a fight that he doesn't need to be well-rounded in. You just need to take advantage of the spots that you are going to be significantly good at, like the striking. I do think that AJ McKee's striking is going to be better, but I don't see AJ keeping it striking the whole time. Um, I don't know if 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 uh, D'Souza's grappling is going to be good enough to catch AJ McKee because AJ McKee is good in the ground. I think if he does, if they do play on the ground, I think it will be good enough to have AJ McKee defending the whole time that D'Souza ends up winning as a result of the fight that ends up happening on the ground. But I may not, I don't see him necessarily catching AJ McKee in a submission to finish the fight that way. Um, I don't see him beating him in a stand up fight at all. Uh, I think if anybody ends up standing up, you know, AJ McKee, I think, takes his head off if he, if he decides to do that. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see D'Souza even pull guard in this fight at some point. Um, I would say the same thing about Clever, to be honest, too. So I think it's I think it's going to be the closest fight out of the two. Um, I think they both have their avenues to win, but I think they both need to stick to the game plans that work best for them because they're, there's avenues that are going to work really, really well, and then there's the avenues that you fucking shouldn't even open the door to at all. Uh, and that's from both sides. So, um, difficult fight to pick. I'm an AJ McKee fan. I'm not going to act like I was a DeSouza fan before this because I kind of wasn't. I didn't really know too much about him until I started looking him up and watching some fights. Uh, so I'm going to go with AJ McKee here by decision. I think this will be the first decision on DeSouza's record. I'm glad okay. you pointed out how good uh, McKee is on the mat as well in, in his grappling because I should have made that point, and it's part of the reason I'm comfortable enough to pick AJ McKee. Imagine fighting D'Souza knowing that in all of his fight, however many was it, 17 fights total? They 14, all, oh, 15 total, 14 and one, yeah. Yes. They all end by finish. And it's like, you're probably, you know you're going to get finished by him. Yeah. Or somebody is. Maybe him, but probably you. <laughs> but what it normally tells me about those kind of fights, when, when guys have fights like that, it just means that they don't, in my opinion, it just means they don't generally take their foot off the pedal. Like these sounds like th these are fights that guys are continuously moving forward, continuously trying to implement some sort of game. And I think a lot of times we see fights, especially in the UFC with high level stakes, guys tend to just coast and move around and try to rack up points and don't really put themselves in the line of fire. D'Souza doesn't really do that. D'Souza is literally lit on fire all the time for better or worse. Um, you know, he hasn't fought in my opinion. There are a lot of guys that he has fought that he's had some difficulty with that. I think if you saw them in the UFC would probably not make it out of the top 40. Um, so there is, there's something to be said about the, the, the disparity in the striking, but I do think that D'Souza will be able to kind of at least make it competitive up until a certain point. But I do think McKee runs away with it. Okay. That My question start. is, what does yeah. Ryzen do if they go 0 and 5? Which we both but this is, pred predicted them to do. Like, how do you continue this is, to market yourselves if you go 0 and 5 in this event? This yeah. is why the UFC will never do it. Because as long as the UFC is considered the number one promotion, they don't have shit to prove to anybody. Right. Yeah, They literally, it's lose-lose for them in every single sense of the word for them to do a cross-promotion fight. There's no point in them doing it. They don't have to prove anything. They're already winning. Yeah, I a little bit of a tangent here, but I uh, over Christmas Tommy from unboxing was in town. First time I saw him in like 13 years, we figured it out, which was pretty cool. Um, Jesus, but uh, we've recorded a little thing for his pod real quick. So if you're still listening to this, go check out unboxing. I'm going to be up there Ooh. for like a 15 minute recording that we did, a little MMA boxing crossover questions. But he was asking me about cross promotion, and it, do I think the UFC would ever get involved? And we were talking about this event. And I said, the, the only thing that's interesting to me is, like, say AJ McKee wins this fight, right? Then say, like, they try to work something else out down the line where he fights, like, Olivier Aubameau-Mercier from, from PFL, PFL. Or he fights 
the champ from one FC. Like, and he wins again. Like, it can reach a point where he can be on a mic and be like, I've beaten the champ of every organization. I'm the best lightweight in the world, or I'm the best whatever. And if if we ever got to that kind of a point where, like, the other organizations were cross-promoting and one guy kept winning, I could see someone in the UFC be like, Dana, I want to fight this guy. And I, I think that's when it it could get interesting, if we ever were to see it. I think the only way you see it is if they bring the guy into the UFC, which they would happily do, I would imagine. But you're yeah. not going to get somebody walking in there against the UFC champ under another banner. You yeah. won't do it. It won't happen. As long as Dana White is alive, it won't happen. Yeah. Which is balls, by the way, because there are some nasty fights to be made. Nasty fights. Yeah. yeah. There are, man. <sighs> All right, boys, let's end on this. It is not a trivia question. But it is a quick prompt, uh, and I, for, this, for the interest of time, because I'm going to be waking up here tomorrow with three babies uh, early in the morning. Fuck. Give me two things. I need two things from both of you. Favorite fight of the year and the fight of next year that you're most anticipating. Dude, we, we can do an episode on this, because oh, I was going to say that – Next week, we're, all we're going to have is recapping the, these five fights. And then we can fill the rest of the episode with this kind of shit. Okay, then let's just do that. But, okay. <laughs> so don't answer you then? <laughs> don't answer, but think about it. All right. You know what we could do? So we, we'll recap these five fights. We could revisit the predictions we made for 2022 and see how right we were and shit. Because remember, we did an episode of that. Oh, Fuck, who remembers idea. that? And then we could do a little Jesus recap. Christ. I think I might I have noted remember. what we what we did. I think I might have wrote it down. Watch it. All right. I'll look. So I, I really think I wrote remember it down. what I ate this morning. But yeah, we'll catch up. We'll catch up on that. All right, folks. Well, thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the fights this weekend. Bellator versus Rise in action. And uh, happy New Year. Yeah. Happy New Year. See you. See you next week slash next year. Yep. Oh, baby. Another year of and new MMA in your face. There it is. Yeah, man. Yes. Cool. Keep going. Keep going. Thank you, people. All right, guys. Leave a like. Leave a comment. Happy New Year. Bye, right, boys. We'll see you 2023. Okay. Peace. Peace.